fears of a potential pandemic with six countries now reporting instances of a mysterious coronavirus. Bridget McKenzie faces mounting pressure over sport grants. A club she's a member of received almost $36,000 under the scheme. Republicans block moves for fresh evidence in the impeachment trial of US President Donald Trump. And fears an Australian startup which has developed facial recognition software could change privacy as we know it. Hello, welcome to ABC News. I'm Karina Cavallo. Six people are dead and almost 300 officially infected as China seeks to control the outbreak of a new virus that's threatening to spread further during the Lunar New Year travel rush. The coronavirus has reached four other nations, Japan, Thailand, South Korea and most recently the United States. It appears to have begun at a seafood market in Wuhan. In Australia, a Brisbane man is waiting for test results to determine and whether he has the virus. Australia's Chief Medical Officer Dr Brendan Murphy has told AM it's a changing situation the Health Department is keeping a close eye on. Things have changed a lot over the last three or four days. Uh, there have been a significant increase in case numbers, evidence of some human-to-human -human transmission and uh, we've heard reports now of six deaths, even though the case numbers are uh, probably over 300. So we have more concern than we had last week, but uh, we're well prepared in this country to respond. Dr Sanjay Senanayaka, Associate Professor of Medicine at the ANU, says the virus will likely spread to several countries. We've already seen it hit, I think it's uh, five countries now, including the first country outside Asia, the US. But interesting, if you look back at SARS in uh, 2003, despite uh, so many cases around the world, in the end we only had one probable case in Australia. And part of that could be attributed to uh, the screening we did. We keep alluding to SARS when talking about this virus because it's really only three weeks since we learnt about this outbreak. But we do know that uh, in terms of molecular structure, it's most similar to the SARS virus. So we think it'll act like that. In terms of what we need to know about it is how effective it's trans, uh, how effectively it is transmitting from human to human. Now, if you'd asked me about uh, five or six days ago, I'd have said it seems to be very, very limited. But now, uh, after 14 healthcare workers got infected from a case, it looks like it, it's more effective at transmitting from human to human. And that will also have an impact on how we think it'll spread in other populations. So that's uh, one thing. The, the death rate uh, obviously is important. And at this stage, something which seems to be quite uh, good is that it has a low death rate. SARS killed about 15 per cent of people. This kills about 2 per cent of people at the moment. Deputy Nationals leader Bridget McKenzie is facing increased pressure today to explain how a gun club she's a member of was awarded a $36,000 grant from a program she oversaw. Labor is calling for Senator McKenzie's head, arguing her position in Cabinet is untenable. Political reporter Matthew Doran joins us from Parliament House. Matthew, can you explain the link between Senator McKenzie and this gun club? Well, back in January 2019, Senator McKenzie visited the Wangaratta Clay Target Club in northeast Victoria. And the club itself, in its uh, newsletter posted on its website, uh, had some photos of the senator, including one where she's signing what appears to be a membership form. And the club said that it's rare to be able to boast uh, a federal minister among your membership ranks, but that Senator McKenzie had become a full fee paying member of the Wangaratta Club. A month later, Senator McKenzie arrived at the club alongside the Nationals candidate for the seat of Indi to announce that it had been successful in its application for a $36,000 grant to upgrade its facilities under the Community Sports Infrastructure Grants Program, which she oversaw at the time because she was at that stage the Sports Minister. Now, her office uh, has got in contact with the ABC this morning and has said uh, that the funding for that round of grants under the scheme, which was round two, uh, 
was uh, opened up in December 2018, so a month before that initial visit, uh, seeming to suggest that uh, the consideration of the gun club's application began before Senator McKenzie's involvement. They've also defended the fact that uh, Senator McKenzie hasn't declared her membership of the club on her register of senators' interests, which is a document that all senators and indeed all members in the other house have to fill out, showing what their financial interests are, whether they be uh, mortgages or investment uh, property income, everything down to any gifts that they get. They said that the membership from the club was a gift to the minister, that it was valued at less than $300 and therefore it wasn't necessary to declare it formally on that register. Regardless of that, she is facing pressure today and many questions are being thrown at her colleagues, including her fellow Nationals Minister David Littleproud. He was on Eden on the New South Wales South Coast and he said that, uh, of course, uh, the, these details are being looked through, but he's, haste, uh, he's, he's urging people not to rush to conclusions. Look, obviously uh, those reports have come to light uh, this morning and uh, as I understand the Attorney-General's uh, looking at, at the entire program as did the Auditor-General and I think uh, there's a lot of sideline commentators at the moment. I think obviously uh, there needs to be an understanding of all the circumstances before everyone uh, becomes uh, judge, jury and executioner. Matthew, does it appear Senator McKenzie will step aside? Not at this stage and certainly she has the backing also of members of her front bench uh, or the front, her front bench colleagues, her Prime Minister Scott Morrison says that he supports her in the role and has said uh, repeatedly that she has acted within the rules when it came to this community sports fund. Of course this pressure began last week when the Auditor General released a scathing report about the scheme which said that Bridget McKenzie and her office had ignored advice from sports. Australia about which clubs were eligible for funding and further than that which clubs should be awarded funding under this $100 million scheme. The Auditor General finding that Bridget McKenzie and her office had picked other clubs that weren't necessarily at the top of the list that Sport Australia had put forward to them and also that there was a disproportionate number of grants given to clubs in marginal coalition seats or indeed seats that the coalition was targeting at the May 2019 election. The position keeps getting put forward is that all of these clubs were eligible for funding but uh, Labor isn't holding back when it is uh, calling for her to resign. Bill Short and the Labor frontbencher echoing the comments of his new leader Anthony Albanese today saying that Bridget McKenzie has to go. Anthony Albanese made it very clear that he wouldn't have that uh, in a Labor government and if she won't resign then Scott Morrison just needs to act. I mean, uh, the fact that she was granting funding to an organisation she's a member to and failed to disclose it, that's sort of politics 101. You get that right, don't you? Bill Shorten speaking earlier here in Parliament House. So this whole incident has caused a lot of concern for sporting clubs and a lot of scrutiny as to exactly where this money has gone. Clubs are saying that, uh, many clubs are saying that they did everything by the book and that they didn't see this as a political situation but the sheer fact that the Auditor General has found that Bridget McKenzie ignored that initial advice and uh, started to supplement their list with her own clubs to get funding has drawn this into quite a political debate. Karina? Matthew Doran reporting from Canberra. The Senate impeachment trial of US President Donald Trump has begun with Democrats and Republicans squabbling over the rules. Democratic efforts to obtain documents relating to Mr Trump's dealings with Ukraine were blocked by the Republic-controlled Senate. And the President's defence team attacked the case as baseless. North America correspondent David Lipson reports. Almost four months to the day since Democrats invoked impeachment, the trial of Donald John Trump is finally underway. The Senate will convene as a court of impeachment. 100 senators are now acting as jurors. All persons are commanded to keep silent on pain of imprisonment. Their role now is to listen and decide whether to remove President Trump from office for pressuring Ukraine to investigate his political rival, Joe Biden, then impeding the subsequent inquiry. The charges here involve the sacrifice of our national security at home and abroad and a threat to the integrity of the next election. When you look at these articles of impeachment, they're not only ridiculous, they are dangerous to our republic. 
Even the trial rules are bitterly contested. The Republicans wanted to stop last month's impeachment evidence from being automatically admitted and for hearings to run into the early hours of the morning. The McConnell resolution will result in a rushed trial with little evidence in the dark of night. Literally, the dark of night. But when the rules were laid out, they'd been amended to more closely resemble Bill Clinton's trial 21 years ago. The fact the proposed rules changed in the space of 24 hours is a sign that moderate Republicans are taking this trial seriously. The big question is whether they'll allow new evidence in the form of witnesses and documents. Democrats want to call former National Security Advisor John Bolton and White House Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney. Both were ordered not to appear in last year's impeachment inquiry. We are ready to call our witnesses. The question is, will you let us? Several senators appear amenable. To uh, hear from John Bolton and perhaps other witnesses, obviously from both the defense as well as the prosecution. But they risk the wrath of the president and his supporters if they make it happen. It was a hoax. Uh, it goes nowhere because nothing happened. Removing Donald Trump from office remains inconceivable. The Democrats' best hope is to wound him before the election. David Lipson, ABC News, Washington. Activist Greta Thunberg has admonished world leaders for ignoring the plea from young people to act on climate change. She was speaking at the annual World Economic Forum in Davos, where global warming is high on the agenda. US President Donald Trump hit back, dismissing climate campaigners as prophets of doom. Europe correspondent Bridget Brennan reports. In the age of anxiety over climate change, the World Economic Forum this year is as much about the environment as the economy. The star speaker was Greta Thunberg, the 17-year-old Swedish activist who's inspired a movement. Well, I'm here to tell you that, unlike you, my generation will not give up without a fight. The facts are clear, but they are still too uncomfortable for you to address. Referencing the catastrophic bushfires in Australia, she blasted world leaders and told them to stop investing in fossil fuels. Our house is still on fire. Your inaction is fueling the flames by the hour. A long way from his troubles at home, Donald Trump used his speech at the forum to rebuke climate activists. This is a time for tremendous hope and joy and optimism and action. But to embrace the possibilities of tomorrow, we must reject the perennial prophets of doom and their predictions of the apocalypse. Australia's representative at Davos, the finance minister, Matthias Cormann, backed Mr Trump's call for optimism. I, I was uh, in uh, the audience. I thought it was a great speech. Uh, it, was, it was a fantastic speech. Outside, protesters, some dressed as koalas, called for climate justice. These koalas climbed to Davos to get answers for why are they still investing in Adani? Uh, why, why are these things happening? How is it you can, with a straight face, continue to destroy the planet? 100 companies are responsible for 71% of global emissions since 1988, and many of them are members of the WEF. 50 years since it began, the World Economic Forum says it's now asking multi-billion dollar corporations to put planet alongside profit. Bridget Brennan, ABC News. Lebanon has formed a new government, clinching a deal on a cabinet that must tackle the country's worst economic crisis in decades. Prime Minister Hassan Diab will lead 20 specialist ministers backed by political parties. The move hasn't satisfied protesters who've been calling for sweeping changes and an independent, non-sectarian cabinet to deal with the economic and financial crisis. People have been hit hard by banks' restrictions on access to cash, job losses and inflation. Two members of the Mongols' outlaw motorcycle gang have been charged with the murder of Paul Vagona in Melbourne's east last year. For more, I'm joined by reporter Zalika Rizmal from Melbourne. Zalika, what do we know about the raids, the raids that have led to these charges today? 
Well, we know that uh, there were dawn raids conducted across 12 properties right across Melbourne this morning. Now, we know that most of those properties have some sort of link with the outlaw motorcycle gang, the Mongols. Now, the properties raided include several houses, two storage units, a tattoo parlour that's owned uh, by ex-Richmond uh, uh, footballer Jake King and also uh, by former high-ranking Bandidos member Toby Mitchell, who's most recently also been linked to the Mongols and in addition also two Mongols clubhouses, one uh, in Port Melbourne and another out in the city's east at a Fern Tree Gully. Now police say that they seized six firearms, uh, drugs and a speedboat during those raids and arrested three men, two of whom have now been charged with Mr Paul Vergonia's murder. Now just on the circumstances surrounding uh, Mr Paul uh, Vergonia's murder, uh, we didn't learn much new information today. We we know that the 46-year-old fruiterer uh, was driving on his way to work in the early hours of the 9th of November last year uh, when he was shot dead uh, with his car being sprayed with bullets as he drove along East Link uh, at Donvale in the city's east. Now recently police held a press conference uh, with Mr Begonia's family talking about the fact that they had no indication about a motive behind uh, this killing. Now today uh, again they gave no indication of, of having any new information there, but they again stressed that they believe that Mr Vergonia had no criminal background or association uh, with any of these gangs. Uh, here's Tess Walsh, uh, Assistant Commissioner from Crime Command, uh, uh, giving one point on that issue. And we um, have been at pains to say Mr Vergonia has no criminal associates and there's nothing in his background that would suggest that um, anything he or his family have done uh, have been uh, part of the reason why he's been the victim of this heinous crime. What do we know about the three people arrested this morning, Zalika? Well, uh, regarding the two men who have been charged with murder, uh, we still uh, don't know their identities. We know that a 25-year-old man from Kilsyth and a 29-year-old man from Port Melbourne have been charged. Uh, now, the police didn't confirm whether they were actually members of the, the Mongols gang, but they said that they were definitely linked. Uh, now, they're uh, due to appear in court this afternoon, so no doubt we'll be uh, hearing of their identities. The third man, we also don't have uh, his name, but we know he's a 30-year-old man uh, from Montrose who was also arrested as part of these uh, raids this morning. Uh, he's currently being questioned by police, and police say that they're expecting he will be charged with drug and potentially also firearm offences later today. Salika Rismal reporting. Convicted paedophile and former New South Wales Labor Minister Milton Orkopoulos has been charged with failing to comply with his reporting obligations. The fresh charges come as the State Parole Authority decides to delay a decision over whether to revoke his parole. Reporter Amy Greenbank has more. Amy, what will police allege? Well, police searched Mr Okopoulos' Malabar home in Sydney South East last week and they'll allege they found evidence that he changed his personal information without reporting it, something that breached his parole obligations. Now, it's believed to relate to trying to activate his social media account. In the early hours of this morning, he was arrested and has since been charged and granted conditional bail. His matter will return to court a little bit later today. But in the meantime, just as the news of the arrest came to light, the news New South Wales Parole Authority was meeting to determine whether or not to uh, send Mr Okopoulos back to prison, whether they should revoke his parole. They have now decided to delay that decision until after this court appearance. And Amy, what was Mr Okopoulos originally jailed for? Well, in 2008, the former Labor minister was found guilty of 30 drug and child sex offences. He was originally sentenced to 13 years and eight months behind bars. He has served 11 and a half years of that term before being uh, released on parole. Now, during that time, he failed two drug tests. The latest was in February last year. Uh, if his parole is eventually revoked at a later date, he will be required to return to prison to serve out the remaining of that term, which will expire in October next year. Okay, Amy Greenbank reporting. 
Finance News Now and I'm joined by Sue Lannan. Sue, legal action again against the National Australia Bank. Yes, this is being taken by uh, uh, customers, superannuation members of two National Australia Bank superannuation funds. So they're alleging that National Australia Bank breached uh, superannuation laws. So this involves more than 300,000 people. It involves billions of dollars in superannuation funds. And the, the case is being run by the law firm Morris Blackburn. So Andrew Watson, who's the head of class actions at Morris uh, Blackburn, is alleging that the two superannuation trustees breached their duty to act in the best interests of members. By delaying their transition uh, into my super accounts, um, we, we say that uh, that transition could have occurred much earlier than it did. And as a result, 330,000 account holders paid uh, higher fees and were actually in worse performing funds than if they'd been transferred at an earlier point into the my super accounts. And these my super accounts, these were government mandated accounts that were much cheaper. So what sort of money are we talking about here in terms of customer funds? Well, so the quantum of the funds transferred, and I want to emphasise it's the quantum of the funds transferred, not the actual damages, is $6.3 billion. So it's a lot of money. Um, the actual damages that have been incurred will be substantial, but will be the subject, obviously, enough of expert evidence about what uh, each individual account holder would have been, would have stood to gain if they'd been transferred at an earlier point in time. Are you able, though, to give a ballpark figure of what sort of damages these uh, customers will be claiming? Well, again, it's impossible to give a ballpark figure for individual customers because their account balances will vary significantly and um, uh, as a result the fees and the difference in performance will vary according to those balances. But it's a class action which will be worth a very substantial sum of money, at least in the tens of millions and perhaps more. OK, so that case probably has a long way to go. Sue, how are the markets looking today? Yeah, well, surprisingly, the Australian market has defied global markets. We've just seen the ASX 200, the benchmark, hit a new record high, Karina, of 7,114. Now, that is despite, as I said, the worries about the coronavirus, the worries about global growth, and also Australian consumers, just a new survey showing that confidence has fallen because of the bushfires. But still, Australian investors remain optimistic for the time being. Let's have a look at the numbers. The ASX 200, 7,109. Now, this figure delayed by 20 minutes. As I mentioned, the current figure is 7,114. And the market up, up just about across the board, led by consumer tech stocks and oil stocks have also come off their lows. Taking a look at the top movers, Santos, the oil and gas firm, saw record oil production over the year thanks to higher output because of its purchase of Quadrant Energy in WA. Uh, however, it did see lower LNG prices, so quarterly revenue fell. And the gold miner, St Barbara Down, it's lowered its production guidance yet again for its Australian and PNG mines. And going up today, Poly Novo, it's got its first orders from some European countries for its wound dressing product. Now, in Asia, the Nikkei has, is higher, up 26 points. New Zealand market also higher. Now, we did see Wall Street fall from record highs on fears about that deadly virus outbreak in China. Investors also concerned about the downgrade to global economic growth by the International Monetary, Monetary Fund. The Dow Jones Index lost half a percent or 152 points. Commodity prices also lower on the worries about the global outlook. Spot gold has dipped and so did West Texas crude and tapas crude in Singapore. The Australian dollar also weaker, now below 68.4 US cents. It's at the lowest in around 10 weeks. And that's finance. Thanks very much, Sue.
The boss of Huawei has issued a plea to leaders gathered from, for the World Economic Forum in Davos to avoid starting a tech war. Ren Zhengfei's comments come as Britain looks, to, looks set to defy warnings from the US and allow the Chinese tech company to be involved in the rollout of 5G networks in the UK. Josh Taylor from The Guardian says the message from the Huawei chief executive was clear. He was essentially arguing that, you know, with any great leap in technology, there's always a lot of fear associated with it. And um, essentially what you're going to have is, you know, these countries are fighting now, no, not sort of the, in the way wars were fought before, but in terms of uh, it's much more covert now and, and uh, it, it's happening on networks and things like that. His, his, his discussion more broadly was, was very sort of uh, high level, um, futuristic kind of, you know, are we going to get to AI wars? Are people going to be cybernetic and be hacked and things like that? But but the obviously the underlying discussion is about what Huawei and what China's role is in, in the future of tech. And I think that, that we're, we're starting to see now sort of alliances forming between particularly the Five Eyes uh, security nations that, that includes Australia mm. and, and um, obviously against China as well. We've heard um, Australian Signals Director here in Australia essentially say that um, the way that they advised the government was that, you know, with previous networks, um, there was a way to separate out different parts in the network. So if there was a potentially compromised bit in one part of the network, it wouldn't f affect the rest of the network. What mm -hmm. they're saying now is that 5G means that it's all it's all compromisable and, and we need to be safe rather than, and, than sorry. And that extends to global networks as well. And I think that's why they're worried about it. The well, now with sport news, here's Patrick Galloway. Thanks, Karina. Nick Kyrgios is celebrating a straight sets round one win over Lorenzo Sonigo at the Australian Open. National sports reporter David Mark joins us from a windy Melbourne Park. David, how decisive was that performance? It was very decisive, Patrick. I mean, he won in straight sets. It was 6-2, 7-6, 7-6. Sonigo is a good player. He's got a really big serve. But Kyrgios wasn't really troubled. He didn't actually face a break of serve in any of his games. So he was good, but he was also mixing it up too. So he was obviously he's got that big serve, but he was also playing quite a deft touch game, coming up to the net quite a lot, and also playing a lot of really exquisite little drop shots. So he was really mixing it up and um, had a lot of support from the crowd too, Pat. I mean, there's a bit of a love-hate relationship with uh, Nick Kyrgios in Australia, but he definitely had the crowd on, him, on his side last night. And then after the match, he dedicated it to his his friend Alex de Menor, who of course has uh, got an injury and so couldn't play in the Australian Open. So it seems as well as playing good tennis, he's actually quite endearing himself to the Australian crowd. Speaking of players who the Australian public love, Ash Barty will be looking to advance to the third round today. Dave, what do you make of her chances? She's playing Slovenia's Polona Hercog. They've not played before. Hercog is ranked 48th in the world. Ash Barty had a kind of a scratchy match in the first round. She lost the first set, uh, but then came back really strongly in the last two sets, 6-1, 6-1. And she's obviously warming into her game. Um, she's obviously the number one in the world, Hercog 48. So you'd expect that she's going to do quite well. She loves playing here at the Australian Open. She's feeling very confident. And, and one thing we keep hearing from Ash Barty is about the team around her and how that she's really having a good time. So you'd expect her to advance, but she would be the first to say that no matter who you're playing, they've always got a chance, and so you have to take it very seriously. Will be interesting to see how she performs today. Looks like it's quite windy down there at Melbourne Park. How are the, the players going to deal with the conditions, and, and who else should we, we be looking out for today? Patrick, it is really, really windy. It's not going to be such a problem for the big stars who are playing on Rod Laver Arena or Margaret Court Arena, but for any of those lesser lights who are on the outside courts, it's going to be really tricky. It's gusting up a lot. You may be able to see something behind me, but uh, it's almost, you know, we've had things blowing over here where we're doing our crosses. So ball tosses, the ball's going to be going all over the place, so it's going to be tricky for those players on the outside courts. But the players we can watch out for today, amongst the Australians, Jordan Thompson and John Millman, who both had wins yesterday. Also Mark Polmans who had that uh, against the odds victory. He's, a, he's ranked in the top in the hundreds. Uh, he's never won a Grand Slam event before. A sort of 22 year old journeyman from Australia. And also um, Astra Sharma who is actually playing a first round match because of those rain delays we had on the first day. She's yet to play. But the big names, Novak Djokovic will be up today. Serena Williams. Roger Federer who was absolutely fantastic in that first round match. 
doing everything that we know and love from Roger Federer, um, the all-court game, beautiful serving, cross-court, deft shots, almost playing a serve volley game. He looked really in great touch, so it will be great to see him tonight. And Stefanos Tsitsipas will be up sometime this afternoon with his uh, very large army of Greek supporters that he's got here in Melbourne, so it'll be good to see, um, good to see him play too, Pat. All right, Dave, thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of day three. That was David Mark there, the national sports reporter for ABC News. There was still some cricket to talk about. A big game in the Big Bash last night. The Hobart Hurricanes beat the Melbourne Renegades by four runs. The Renegades have struggled a lot this season in the Big Bash. They went into this game having only won two games through the season. Uh, certainly some big hitting from the Hobart Hurricanes. Mac Wright got 70 not out. Plenty of people trying to take catches in the crowd. That was a good one there. But there was an incident in this match involving concussion. As you can see here, Nathan Ellis, the Hurricanes fast bowler, ended up being a bystander as Sam Harper, the 23-year-old Victorian cricketer, tumbled over him and suffered concussion. He was quite uh, unsteady when he rose to his feet and doctors actually had to come on the field, treat Sam Harper for concussion. There was a moment there where it looked like he might bat on for the Renegades during their run chase, but doctors quite sensibly decided to substitute him out of the field. He was actually the first concussion substitute in the Big Bash. It just shows you how much sentiment is changing. He had a quick word to Hobart captain Matthew Wade as he was coming off the field. This is Wade explaining what he said. I said to him then that it didn't look good when he tried to get up, so I think the doctor really had no choice in that instance for him to, to go off the ground, and especially... Sam's had history of concussion. He got a really bad one in Adelaide over a few years ago. And it took him a long time to come back. So I was pretty, I was pretty certain that he, they made the right, right call to get him off. Yeah, it did look nasty, didn't it, Patrick? Well, the Melbourne Victory's Asian Champions League campaign, it's well on track after a big win. It is, Karina. They beat Bali United 5-0 last night at home. They're trying to join Perth and Sydney FC in the Asian Champions League group stage. This was a preliminary game. They've got a very strong record in the Champions League, does the victory. They've been in it seven times before. They got off to a great start in the 14th minute and they went in, went on to net another four goals after that to win 5-0. A good performance from them. Uh, Robbie Cruz got on the score sheet, the former Socceroo. He's battled with injury this season, has Robbie Cruz. So good to him see him score a goal. The Swedish striker Ola Toivonen was another to score. Have a look at this goal. The ball gets cleared out by Bali United and then with one touch... Doink into the back of the net. Ola Toivonen, he's a very, very good player. So the victory now play Kashima Antlers, a Japanese team, a J-League team. So they're one win from qualifying for the Asian Champions League. Great stuff. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Karina. The top stories on ABC News. Australia's chief medical officer says strict procedures are in place to monitor travellers coming into Australia to ensure a deadly coronavirus doesn't spread. At least six people have died from the virus and the US has recorded its first case, a man who arrived in Seattle from Wuhan last week. The greatest concern is in China as millions of people travel for the Lunar New Year. Deputy Nationals leader Bridget McKenzie is under mounting pressure to resign over her handling of the government's Community Sport Infrastructure Grants Program. It's been revealed almost $36,000 was given to a clay target shooting club in regional Victoria. Senator McKenzie was a member of the group. The $100 million scheme has been criticised by the Auditor General because a disproportionate number of grants went to marginal and targeted seats before last year's election. Democrats seeking to remove the US President Donald Trump from office have failed in early attempts to subpoena new evidence for his impeachment trial. Senators will determine whether Mr Trump abused his power and obstructed justice. Democrats have objected to proposed rules for compressed arguments and a speedy trial, saying it won't be fair. And privacy experts have raised concerns over facial recognition technology developed by a US-based Australian entrepreneur that matches surveillance footage with images from social media profiles. Some law enforcement agencies in the United States are using the technology known as Clearview AI. Rights advocates are warning it could erode privacy in public spaces. 
Well, for many of us, social media is a part of our daily lives. But what happens when you're called for jury duty and can no longer share your pictures or opinions? Gemma Holt has authored a report on the subject of jurors and social media use for the Tasmania Law Reform Institute. She joins me now from Hobart. Thank you so much for your time. Firstly, how prevalent is social media use by jurors during a trial? That's a really good question to start on uh, with because ultimately we don't know. So uh, in terms of the wide ranging research and consultation that the Law Reform Institute has undertaken in Hobart this year, what has become apparent is that there is a widespread general perception that it is prevalent. The significance of that is that it is as equally capable of undermining confidence in the criminal justice system, the perception alone as opposed to documented cases. So what does the report recommend? In short, the, re the report recommends uh, juror education as the key. There are different stages throughout the process where jurors uh, provided information, training and uh, instructions as to exactly what their roles and obligations are as jurors. This happens uh, when they first arrive at the courthouse as prospective jurors before they're even chosen to be on a particular criminal trial. They, they receive uh, information and training. Thereafter, if and when they're chosen as jurors on a trial, they also get given instructions or directions from the particular trial judge. At both of these stages, they receive uh, information about what they can and can't do regarding social media and the internet. Uh, what we've identified is there's deficiencies in both of these uh, stages and real areas of improvement uh, that can be made. Do you have any examples in Tasmania of jurors using social media and that having an effect on trials? Because it can lead to a mistrial or even a juror facing a jail sentence. Certainly, that is uh, the worst case scenario in terms of impact on the criminal justice system. In terms of documented cases in Tasmania, what we have been able to um, realise through this report is there has been an isolated instance in 2015 where jurors in a Supreme Court trial in Launceston researched on the internet as opposed to social media generally about legal terms, uh, terms beyond reasonable doubt, circumstantial evidence. And this matter was it came to the attention of uh, court staff after verdicts had been delivered. That is, court staff discovered printouts of the material in the jury room. In terms of the impacts on the actual trial, the matter was investigated on appeal and in that particular instance it was determined that it would not uh, give rise to revisiting the trial verdict at first instance. What about the high profile Gable Tosti trial from Queensland a few years ago? There was a juror there who was using a social media and it was um, making it obvious and identifiable that they were a juror in that trial posting photographs of their coffee from during the day. Now, that didn't result in a mistrial, but nonetheless, the Queensland Law Society said the Jury Act needed to change as a result? So that uh, example is particularly important, firstly, because it does show uh, a um, matter that was highlighted by the Institute's research, is that it's not just a matter of the Googling juror. It's not just jurors who go intentionally online to research matters on the internet about particular uh, cases. It really is much more broader than that. It can involve a juror just going about their habitual social media and internet use, identifying themselves as a juror and making it very apparent not only that they're a juror but they're sitting on a high profile criminal trial and they're attending the Supreme Court on a daily basis to that end. What's important is that that case, whilst it wasn't found to have interfered with that matter on that occasion, it really does show the potential for jurors to inadvertently fall into error, to inadvertently get themselves into trouble by what would be otherwise normal social media and internet use, just continuing once they're jurors. So in terms of that highlighting change, it really does show that we're dealing with a much broader problem and that a lot of the juror education now, it does focus just on Facebook, just on particular isolated examples, and jurors really aren't re receiving the, the um, education they need as to exactly what they can and cannot do. 
OK, so how do you police or prevent someone who is on a jury from using social media once they've left the courthouse? Again, that's a very good question. In terms of policing uh, what jurors do in their own time after they leave the courthouse, that is a great uh, impossibility. It's not possible to segregate jurors from the online world, and nor is it possible to monitor what they're doing on the online world. This really does lead into the Institute's recommendation of education being key. When jurors are educated about not only what they can and can't do, but why, the rationale underpinning that, it, it enables them to self-regulate. And self-regulation really is the key, because once jurors go home at the end of the day, it's up to jurors themselves to know exactly what they can and can't do, and to navigate their own social media and internet use accordingly. It's a fascinating space. Gemma Holt, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. An Australian entrepreneur has developed a facial recognition app which uses social media photographs to match individuals. Clearview AI is groundbreaking because it has a database of more than 3 billion images scraped from the internet. It's already being used by more than 600 law enforcement agencies in the United States but raises serious privacy and ethical issues. To discuss the app, I'm joined by Bruce Bayer-Arnold from the Australian Privacy Foundation in Canberra. Thank you so much for your time today. How does this app go further than existing facial recognition being used by police forces? Uh, because the, fa ex the existing regime, certainly in Australia, uh, has fairly tight regulation uh, and it's certainly not meant to, in to cover uh, private sector images. So we don't have the police, for example, systematically uh, systematically looking at your, your Facebook images, uh, your uh, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, uh, whatever. There's, there are fairly tough rules there, possibly not as not as well enforced as we might like. But this is this is basically a rogue system, uh, and we should be deeply concerned if it's going to be adopted, used, misused by law enforcement, by national security Australia, agencies in Australia, or indeed by individuals. The, the potential use by individuals. Uh, in Australia and elsewhere is, is deeply worrying. Yeah, I want to come to the uh, subject of bad actors in a moment, but why are police forces using this technology when facial recognition is so problematic already? In particular, it's been proven to fail when identifying darker-skinned people. Darker-skinned people, uh, uh, it has problems with certainly some, for want of a better word, Asian faces, uh, and even with you know your conventional sort of uh, Anglo-Saxon faces, for want of a better word, uh, it's often not very effective. Uh, we don't have a lot of information at the moment about how the system is operating, but there are some indications it probably fails about 60%, 60 percent of the time. Uh, w if we're talking about potential use by law enforcement, that's deeply worrying because we're potentially going after, going after the wrong people. Is there an argument, though, here that technology like this is keeping our communities safer because they work so quickly to cross-reference surveillance footage with the existing database? Well, it's like any technology. Uh, you can you can use a knife to knife to cut up the roast chicken at chicken at Christmas. You can use the knife knife to stab someone. Uh, what we're what we're seeing, I think, is a technology that could be used for a range of for a range of very useful purposes. It could be used for, say, uh, validation when you're. Um, Bank accounts, uh, retail, uh, certainly sort of uh, licensed clubs in Australia use uh, use facial images, uh, but we could also see the same technology being misused by terrorists, uh, by people who want to stalk you. Uh, sometimes we know, regrettably, that law enforcement agencies misbehave, either as an agency or as an individual individual officer, individual person within that agency. So what we really need here is uh, a, a better community and official understanding of the technology and meaningful regulation of the technology. And this is what, one reason why this particular app, this particular service, is deeply worrying because it's, it's basically rogue. Those risks are very real, aren't they, that this could be abused by bad actors and yes. as well as that, that it could be hacked. Yes. Well, we have, you know, what is it, a three billion, three billion image database. Uh, we have no sense 
given the weak regulation, given the uncertainty about what's going on, we have no sense about uh, the security around this database. And we know historically, you know, it's a fact of life that information goes AWOL. Uh, government agencies uh, get hacked. The Australian National University, leading university in Australia. We know that uh, uh, Chinese interests, I think that's a polite way of putting it, uh, were walking, walking their way through the ANU databases uh, day after day, year after year. Uh, we've had major data breach failures in the Commonwealth Government, in the state and territory governments. So if you feel like leading uh, public sector agencies uh, are being breached, uh, we really do need to worry about uh, what appears to be a fairly small small private sector entity and a private sector entity where, where one of the chief investors seems to be Peter Thiel, uh, who has a fairly robust uh, view of uh, human rights, of law enforcement, basically thinks that privacy is a load of hooey. Facial recognition is being trialled at major stadiums in Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne. Do you think Australians are aware that that's taking place? I think they've got some sense and we should be very conscious as a society that, you know, again, the technology is, is very useful, it's very powerful. It will be used in a whole range of ways. So my, my, foreca my forecast recently is that we will see facial recognition being used in universities to deal with cheating. Uh, recognition that sort of, you know, the person who turns up to do an exam, a law exam, for example, is really the person who's supposed, supposed to be there. We will see, fa you know, we see facial recognition being used in, say, hospitals and pathology laboratories because it's no touch. Uh, so no problem about contamination. You just stand in front of, in front of, uh, uh, an imaging device and it recognises, all right, your Dr X, you can be led into the secure facility. So facial recognition as such is not a bad thing. The big concern is how it's used, how it's misused and what we do if it's misused, how we stop it being misused. So meaningful, informed, proportionate regulation. And unfortunately, the Commonwealth Government uh, is still very much behind uh, with that sort of regulation. OK, the future looks fascinating. Bruce Bayer Arnold, thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Fears of foreign influence in the tertiary sector last year prompted the introduction of guidelines to counter the threat. While there have long been concerns about Chinese influence in Australian universities, it's also an issue in Britain. UK institutions have struggled financially in recent years, forcing them to embrace a growing number of enrolments from mainland China. The sun never goes down until nine. My name is Deng Renwei. In UK, people call me Kevin here. It's Liverpool. Music brought him to study in Liverpool. Now he's writing songs about the city for his band. Kevin told me being a student here has given him a different perspective. It made me think things more objectively, especially when I comes to a a global matter. I won't, I won't see it only in a Chinese perspective. So this is the one Almost one in five students at this university are from China, paying fees two or three times higher than UK students. In a uni lab, Yang Bai is working on clean energy, a graduate doing research. The Chinese government is paying for him to be here. Well, I came here and I never see a laboratory will be looks like this. It's, it's amazing. So this is a world-class facility? Yes. It feels like we bring the future to uh, real life. So the science here is being carried out across two countries. China has almost unrivaled resources to put behind research. The Chinese government is paying for 40 PhD students to use the world-class facilities here. It's part of a much wider collaboration. But it's a relationship that some believe has to be handled with care. So would the university risk offending the Chinese government? Would a pro-democracy speaker from Hong Kong be welcome? We would want to be sensitive to um, the um, relationships that we have with any partner. But, you know, we, we are part of the UK higher education sector. Freedom of speech is really important to us. And yet MPs are genuinely worried that universities are being naive in the way that they are engaging with China. I don't think we're influenced in a negative way. Um, 
China is now the second largest research and development economy in the world. You know, they have a quarter of all research and development uh, scientists and researchers in the world. You know, we, we, we cannot afford to ignore um, the contributions that, that Chinese research can make. When democracy protesters took to the streets in Hong Kong, there was an impact on UK campuses. I travelled to another part of the country to meet Hong Kong Chinese students. If I get identified by the Chinese embassy or the Chinese government, then I might um, put the safety of relatives I have living in China um, under threat. They say they've been intimidated by mainland Chinese students. I've had death threats on mainland people's group chats of them saying that they want to kill me over what, um, things that I've put up on university campus and they're saying that they'll bring knives to kill me and they've also well, harassed me by taking photos of the stuff I've put up and where I stay. Young people thousands of miles from home, their families paying for a British education. But does their government now have a bigger say on UK campuses? North Queensland scientists have discovered dozens of new coral species along the Great Barrier Reef. Researchers from James Cook University were part of an international team which toured the reef from Gladstone to the Torres Strait late last year. Professor Andrew Baird is one of the JCU scientists involved. He joins me now from Townsville. Thanks so much for your time today. Tell us a bit more about this trip and its aim. Um, yeah, well, the aim was to uh, discover some new species. So we've been doing a lot of work around the world uh, and uh, we're seeing lots of new species everywhere that we look. So we thought we'd better take a closer look um, closer to home. And so did you know immediately when doing the dives that you discovered new species? Uh, look, we won't know for sure until we do a fair bit more work. Um, we've got a process the molecules and we've got to compare the specimens that we collected to stuff in the museums. But m most of us have seen a lot of corals in a, in a lot of parts of the world. And so you get a good, very good eye for uh, things that you've never seen before. And are these newly grown species or simply species that hadn't previously been identified? Yeah, I think most of them are species that have been overlooked in the past. Uh, I doubt any of them have recently evolved. Um, there's a chance that some of them have, are recent arrivals from uh, further uh, east, like um, uh, New Caledonia. But I think most of them have probably been here uh, for a long time and they've just been overlooked. I ask that because of the significant bleaching that took place in consecutive years along the reef in 2016 and 2017. Uh, yeah, look, um, I mean, I, I was uh, a part of that research. Uh, I, you know, the one good thing, I suppose, or that we can say about that is that it's unlikely that there have been any extinctions. Um, and I suppose the fact that we're finding many new species uh, suggests that, yeah, thankfully, um, nothing has gone extinct as yet. Why is it important to identify accurately different types of coral? That there's, there's not many questions in biology that don't rely on uh, a good taxonomy. Um, conservation in particular, uh, we define species vulnerabilities based on their uh, distribution and abundance. Um, one of the results that we uh, have found is that uh, a lot of these species have very restricted uh, range sizes, uh, which means that they're likely to be much more vulnerable to climate change. And as you learn more about the coral there, what does it tell you about the biodiversity of the reef? Uh, yeah, look, I think, in, you know, it's a lot higher than, than we thought. I mean, we estimate globally in the group that I work with, the Acropora, that there's probably three times as many species as, um, as are listed in the most recent textbooks. So, yeah, I mean, I, I mean apart from just being fascinating, it, it, uh, it uh, throws a completely new light on our understanding of, of how and where these organisms evolved. And just tell us a little bit more about you talking about some of these new species that have been discovered that could be susceptible to climate change. How vulnerable is the reef? You said it's recovered quite well from the bleaching. Oh, look, no, no, there's... The, uh, 
We specifically targeted areas that weren't affected by the bleaching, but we also passed through some areas that were. And realistically, the, the, there has been very little recovery. So there's large areas of the reef that are still in serious trouble. But if I can give you an example of, of vulnerability. So Lord Howe Island, not part of the Great Barrier Reef, but somewhere we've been working for about eight years now. Um, previously, people thought that all the species on Lord Howe Island were also found on the Great Barrier Reef. So it didn't matter if they went extinct on Lord Howe, there'd still be corals here. But what we found is that about 10% of those species on Lord Howe Island uh, are only found on Lord Howe Island. And so that means if there's a big bleaching event down on Lord Howe Island, we'll lose those species and we'll start to see some of the first extinctions in corals globally. Okay, Andrew Baird, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's almost two years since a fast-moving bushfire swept through the town of Tarthra on the far south coast of New South Wales. Although there were significant losses, members of the local Aboriginal community say earlier cultural burns helped to save their land. But there's not enough funding to keep traditional fire management programs going. Bill Brown reports. Members of the Aboriginal community in the Bega Valley are conducting a cool burn. It's a traditional practice designed to clear fuel loads but also promote growth. When a huge bushfire hit Tarthra in early 2018, Aboriginal land, which had been managed this way, was untouched. It was a massive fire and it came up to this block of land and basically just burn around the, the block. An Aboriginal crew had worked on the site a few months before the fire. After we did the burn, we got a lot of the native grasses coming back and native sedges. So what that does is it retains the moisture in the soil. Aboriginal land managers across Australia are working with fire services to introduce cultural burning techniques. Tarthra is seen as one of many successful examples. When the wildfire came through, it's clear as day to see that it was effective. But yet if we were being resourced, that, that range of team for, you know, could have been for years doing those burns all through the landscape and we would have had a much bigger impact. The Bega Local Aboriginal Land Council is the region's largest private landholder and is frustrated it can't do more cool fire burning. It's very short term funding cycles, you might get enough funding to spend a couple of months doing some work and then the funding dries up. You know, one burn here, one burn there, it's not a cultural fire regime. To turn the opportunity into what it can be, we need long term investment. The sooner we're able to do this continuously, the better it's a win win situation for everyone. And with the bushfire risk appearing to get worse, anything that can help is likely to gain interest. Bill Brown, ABC News, Tartra. A group of big cats rescued from circuses in South America has arrived at a sanctuary in South Africa. The animals, both cubs and adults, are among 200 that have been rescued from the circus industry in Guatemala, Peru, Bolivia and Colombia since 2018. Enforcement of the law in Guatemala has been a challenge, so the government has partnered with animal rights groups to help. Time to check the weather with Nate Byrne. We've got activity on both sides of the country at the moment. A very active monsoon bringing some widespread heavy falls to the top end. And then in the south, a very significant cold front dragging a little bit of heat ahead of it, but bringing a very gusty wind change. Damaging winds are expected for much of the southeast. It's helping to increase the fire danger, getting up to extreme in northern Victoria. A broad area of severe fire danger around that. Unfortunately, not bringing a ton of rain, except for in parts of Victoria, although it won't get into central parts of the state until pretty late tonight. Tasmania also getting a decent drink out of that system. It's not until later on in the week when that change moves through New South Wales, first of all on Thursday, increasing the fire danger there but then we'll see some activity in terms of rainfall extending through much of eastern Australia bringing some really decent backup rain after what we saw just a couple of days ago uh, unfortunately though for tomorrow fire danger is going to be the focus particularly in New South Wales where Sydney is looking at a windy 40 degrees Canberra also looking for a windy day 33 the top there now away from that a fine day in Brisbane 33 the top for Melbourne some rain clearing 21 and rain is easing for Hobart, it's getting to 21 there as well. Adelaide does have a possible shower, a bit of wind there easing, 22 will be the top, 27 for Perth, a bit of cloud clearing for you and Darwin, you've got more showers and likely a storm getting to 30.
Well, that's ABC News for now. I'm Karina Cavallio. Coming up on the ABC News channel, we'll take a look at Australia's response to containing a deadly strain of coronavirus. That's coming up.